Hello, welcome to my podcast and my YouTube channel. Today is a milestone. We have reached number 50 in terms of episode. It's the 50th one. And I really wanted to dedicate the 50th episode to something that has been really been on our minds. When I say us, I say mental health professionals. I have one of them with me today, but it, we always thinking about this because of the numbers, the suicide rates are going up, which is youth suicide. And I have actually received in the past two or three weeks, a few emails, people who contacted me, parents who are worried about their kids. So that's what made me decide to dedicate this episode to very uh, straightforward tips on how to deal, to deal with their kids if they're suicidal, maybe they have attempted before, or maybe they're just in crisis. But I really wanted to tackle this with someone that I trust and someone that I know has been doing this for a long, long time. And he is Dr. Mark Golston. He has been a psychiatrist. I'm not going to say for how long, but I know that he's been a professor at UC, um, UCLA, professor of psychiatry for over 25 years. He is now retired, but that's one of the things that he dedicates his time now is to talk to parents, to help them go through kids' crisis, to give them tips on how to help these kids, questions to ask, what to avoid. So I really wanted to have him with me today. He was also uh, for over 20 years, so he was off, oh, sorry, something very important that I forgot to say. He was also an FBI police hostage negotiation trainer. And, but the reason why he's here is actually to tackle this youth suicide because I know he has a lot, I've seen a lot of videos, I've seen him give interviews, I've read his articles. He's very knowledgeable. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Golston. Well, that's a lot to live up to, but I'll, I'll, I'll try not to disappoint you or your uh, audience. No, you won't. I know. I've seen you. I've seen you around. <laughs> well, actually, he was, uh, I'm going to ask a few questions regarding getting ready for this talk. This is a very hard conversation to have with your kids, right? You know, they're in crisis. You notice that they're acting differently, their behavior is differently, maybe they're more isolated, maybe they're more aggressive, or they have mood swings, whatever warning signs the parent has, and they don't know even how to approach, because this is the thing with teens, right, Dr. Golston? They don't want to talk to their parents, they want to talk to their friends. It's, it's the time of their lives when they're trying to find their own identity and know who they are, and they want to, we call it individuation process, right? And when you, when you try to really learn who you are, and one of the things, and it's normal and it's healthy, is you don't want to be around your parents. So that's one, I think, of the challenges for parents. They don't know how to approach. So I wanted to start with that. How can you create, like, there is no perfect, but how can you create an environment that is inviting for your kid to talk to you? Well, first of all, unless your kids start the conversation, they can't stand these heart-to-heart, -heart, face to face conversations, they're going to feel cornered by you. And the reason they're going to feel cornered is because they feel your worry. And you are worried because they're not talking. Uh, they're showing some strange behavior and it's got you worried. So they pick up your anxiety and they're already feeling anxious. So a couple guidelines I offer parents is the best time to have a conversation is when you're doing an activity together, washing the dishes, driving in the car, because then you're not looking at each other, you're sort of looking out and it gives them some breathing space. I think, uh, uh, and then a way to open up your kids' minds, and, and again, none of these are guaranteed because we know how difficult teenagers can be, is I think if you ask them questions such as, uh, uh, can I ask you uh, what uh, what is a subject you're what is a subject you're studying that you can get away with doing things at the last minute versus one you better stay on top of, mm -hmm. you know? And then they might say, "Well, I got to stay on top of uh, math because you fall behind, you never catch up. But if I have to write a paper, I can uh, always do it at the last minute." And you don't give them advice. 
But what you're trying to do is you're trying to teach them judgment. Mm -hmm. Because when they say that to you, they're also saying it to themselves. You can also say, you know, uh, in your class, if you were to guess which of your, which of your friends are going to get into trouble this year, which one? And you're not telling them to avoid that friend, but what you're doing is you're, you're intriguing them with being curious about how they think. And, uh, and, uh, and, and as they begin to share things, mm -hmm. uh, they start to share it with themselves. And, you can, and, and, and so you can come up with all kinds of questions where you, where you really want to get to is, uh, how do you know the different, you know, when you're in a lousy mood and all of us can be in a lousy mood in the family because of COVID and everything. Uh, when you're in a lousy mood, how do you know when it's sticking around too long or when, you know, you're just in a lousy mood and, you know, and it'll blow over. How do you tell mm -hmm. the difference? Mm -hmm. So by inviting them to give you input, uh, that can open them up. Something else I'll share with you, which I thought was remarkable. Uh, Oprah Winfrey occasionally does reports on 60 Minutes. Mm -hmm. And she did a report on a clinic, I believe in Wisconsin, that treats uh, abused children. And what was fascinating is after her segment, they did 60 Minutes Overtime, and a reporter asked Oprah about the segment. And Oprah said it was the most life-changing story she had ever done in her career. Now that's a lot for Oprah Winfrey to say. Wow, yeah. That is a wow. And the uh -huh. reporter said, and the reporter said, what do you mean? And she said, you know, these children who've been abused, they're acting up, you know, they're not just sitting there quietly. And she said, the reason that this clinic was so approached what they would always ask kids is, what happened to you that caused you to act this way? So in other words, they always treated the kids as good kids who were yeah. acting in a way because something happened. And the reporter said to Oprah, so that was life-changing? And Oprah said, absolutely. So I imagine what Oprah was admitting to is that when someone acts up, you know, we often said, why'd you do that? Stop doing yeah, that. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. But she said it reoriented her. And I think that's also another way to uh, talk to kids that when they're acting a certain way, what you, what you communicate is that you believe them to be good and something must have happened. So what happened that you did this? Mm -hmm. yeah. It makes what, so much sense. Yeah, it's so different. You? Yeah. It, as you said, it's so different from why are you doing this? Because when you say, why are you doing this? You're blaming them, right? That's right. That's right. And then another tip I heard from a friend of mine who's a, 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 a rabbi in Los Angeles, and this was so, it might be too eloquent, but I thought it was, she's, he said that when you have good kids and they act up and they know they're in trouble, they already know they did something wrong. And so to just pile on that, uh, makes it worse. And, and what he says, uh, when they do something, or they fail to do something, is he would say to them, um, uh, what you just did is out of out of line with who I believe you to be. What? Yeah, what you just did is out of alignment with who I believe you to be and who I think you believe yourself to be. And I thought that is so eloquent. Mm -hmm. And it gives them the chance because you're not shaming them. What you're saying is uh, what you just did is not the person I know you yeah, to be. I don't, I don't see you there, right? I don't That's recognize right. you. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and I think what happens is the child will, uh, will leave you know, feeling, first of all, grateful to you that they did, that you didn't shame them. You didn't jump on them. Uh, and while I'm on a roll here, can I give you another tip? Of course you can. That's what this is for. I, we want tips. <laughs> so this one, I, I, I can't use the language that is effective, but there's something. Uh, so I have several books and one of my books is called Talking to Crazy, How to Deal with Irrational and Impossible People. So it's not about mm -hmm. mental illness. Um, 
I took a lot of uh, pushback from the psychology and psychiatry professions. They said, how can you write a book called Talking to Crazy? And I said, uh, I said, well, have you read the book? They said, yeah, no. they, they looked at the title and, and they judged it. They said they, they, yeah. they judged it and they said there's so much stigma. I said, I said, no, this is about how do you deal with people who drive you crazy? And the reason I picked the title is it cause it grabs people's attention and it even grabbed your attention to come down on me without even reading the book. The book's about empathy, mm -hmm. about how do you disarm people? Like, like I was just giving you some examples about that. Mm -hmm. But there's but there's one way, another way you can disarm them. Uh, and uh, you'll understand what I'm about to say, but I'll translate it. There's one, one uh, approach called mediated catharsis. Really what it is, is reverse psychology. Mm. And what it means, and this is what it looks like. Let's say you're a parent and I hope some dads are listening to this, but I'm imagining more moms are listening to this because, mm -hmm. you know, moms are you know, more often, they're the ones who focus on this. And so imagine this, you have a child who's uh, not doing their homework or spending too much time on video games. And so the reverse psychology is you knock on their door and you say, uh, honey, can I, uh, can I talk to you? What? Uh, what's this about? Uh, no, I just want to talk to you because uh, uh, I, I had an idea. What? Uh, you know, can we just talk for a few minutes? Okay. So you go in there and you look at your teen and let's say uh, they're not doing their homework or they're spending too much time with video games. And you look at them and you're going to laugh. Try not to laugh. You're an, e you're an easy, you're an easy <laughs> audience. And you say, you say, honey, uh, 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 just say the following to me and, and pretend you mean it. What? You know, just humor me. Just say the following to me. Um, Mom, will you get off my back with the homework already? You know, when you come in and you tell me I need to do my homework and I should stop doing my video games, you make me crazy. You know, and when you do that to me and you leave, the first thing I'm going to do is I may even flip you off and I'm going to do more video games. So could you give it a break already? It's not helping. So honey, could you say that to me? And what, ha I and what happens is you're mediating catharsis. You're giving them something to say to get it off their chest. Now, they normally, they feel that, but they normally wouldn't say that because if they said that on their own, you'd say, oh, you, you're going to have a time out. You're in trouble now, right? You're, you're in trouble, trouble now. Yeah. We're, we're going to take away your video. You know, so they'd be afraid to say it, but the point is the resentment is in there. And when you allow them to say it, and then they say it, you say, you can do better than that. I think you're holding back. And so what you're doing is you're trying to give them the chance to get all this resentment off their chest. Mm -hmm. Because when you talk to teenagers, one of the things many teenagers, or at least some will own up to is they hate hating their parents. Mm. You know, they don't know yeah. where it comes from. They just hate hating their parents and they're stuck with it and they're yeah. irritable. And, 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 and when their parents come in, they don't want to explode at them but you're giving them a way to get stuff off their chest safely. That's why it's called mediating a catharsis. Mm -hmm. And so when you invite them to do that, what will often happen is they will start to giggle. Yeah, like I did. I couldn't stop it. <laughs> yeah, and, they, and, and they're giggling because they're feeling relief. Oh, okay. That and you're showing, you're showing empathy that you know how hard it is for them to resent you. And so you're yeah. giving them a chance to express it. And in some cases, they will feel so much relief to get the anger out safely without you saying you need a time out, that they'll feel grateful to you. Mm -hmm. and, and, and sometimes that it gratitude- It switches, right? And switches their mood. Yeah. And, the, and sometimes that gratitude will switch over to their doing the homework because they're grateful. Yeah. 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 The one, one thing that I heard you say uh, in an interview was also one of the things that they can do with their kids is to share moments, you know, hard, tough moments in their lives when they were teens. And why yeah. is that? Why is that helpful? Well, um, 
as you may or may not know, uh, I was a suicide specialist for many years. Mm -hmm. And a fellow named Jason Reed reached out to me. And his 14-year-old son died by suicide two years ago. So he reached out to me afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and he did a goal cast video. And goal cast videos are often seen by as many as 150 million views. So his goal cast video has uh, 9 million views. But he created a video, which you can show the link to, called Teen Mental Health Webinar. And in the video, he shows the eight-minute video where he spoke to about 12 male founders of companies. Founders. Yeah. And he basically talked about how he felt it was his fault that his son died. And this is what he said. He said, you know, as a dad, an entrepreneur, I don't feel like I'm supposed to tell my family I have problems. He said, I failed 10 times, but I don't, you know, I'm the dad. I don't feel I should have to worry my children. And, and, and he asked them, how many of you have ever shared with your your children your fears and your doubts none of and them failures raised, right yeah, failures none of them raised their hand and he said here's the problem is that when you have a child who is failing and they see you as strong they feel you'll never understand them mm. you know and so and and he gave and, and he shared something that i thought was fascinating he said you know when you ask your children how you're doing and they say great they're usually good but if you say, how are you doing? And they say, I'm fine. They're not. Mm -hmm. I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, and, accurate. Yeah. and and he said, that's, that's what would happen with my child. How are you doing? Fine. And then I'd give him solutions. Mm -hmm. But I didn't make it safe for him to share his failures because he felt if he shared a failure, I would just jump in with a solution. And so he was all alone in that. And so in this teen mental health webinar, uh, he shows the, uh, uh, the eight minute goal cast video. And then the next 25, 30 minutes is me. He just hands it over to me. And then I'm giving some of the tips that I'm giving here, how to break mm -hmm. through to your children. Uh, now, but you have to give it some thoughts because, um, because to just say, uh, share about your fears and concerns uh, it can work, but it can, it, it can also not work. Mm. Uh, and, and, and I think um, one of the ways to introduce it, mm. because, because sometimes children will think, why are you telling me about your stories? It's just another lecture. I don't want to hear about that. Just leave me alone. Uh, there are three questions that I suggest parents ask their kids. And again, I think you should do this while you're doing an activity. Because these face-to-face -face things, unless they come to you, which they won't, mm -hmm. um, they don't want them. And the three questions are this. Uh, you know, when you're doing an activity, you're driving, you say, let me ask you something. Um, at, at, at its absolute worst, at the worst it can be, how awful are you capable of feeling about your life, about about anything. And they might say, why are you asking this? No, just answer the question. At its absolute worst, how awful are you capable of feeling? And they, and they may say pretty awful. And so you really want to relieve this because they're all alone there. Mm -hmm. Say pretty awful or really awful? Really awful. So they're annoyed. You could say, okay, good. Uh, and when you're feeling that way, how alone do you feel? What's this about? Just to answer, how alone do you feel? Pretty alone. Pretty alone or really alone? Okay, really alone. And then what you say to them is, take me to the last time. What? Take me to the last time you felt that. Was it 2.30 in the morning? You couldn't sleep? You were walking around your bedroom? You you know, you were, uh, you were punching the pillow, you felt like punching the wall, take me to it. And here's a fascinating thing that mental health professionals will, will immediately agree with. When you can get someone to describe something so clearly, 
that you as the listener, you as the parent can see it through your eyes, they re-feel it. Mm -hmm. But when they re-feel it, they're not alone. Yeah, then that makes all the difference. Yeah, and, and so if they say, say 2.30 in the morning, good, tell me about 2.30 in the morning. Well, you know, I had this test and I was trying to go to sleep and I couldn't go to sleep. And, uh, and, and so what happened? So I got up, you know, I walked around, uh, and you can even push them. You, you know, what, what did you try to do to get back to sleep? Well, I did some push-ups. You know, uh, uh, you, you might even get out of them if you must know. You know, I looked around for uh, some cold medicine, looked around mm -hmm. for some pills to take. Well, and then what happened? Well, you know, finally at five in the morning, I got back to sleep for an hour. And then what happened? Well, you know, when the, when the uh, day started, I knew I was tired, but I had made it through the night. You know? And then they might say, why are you saying this to me? Uh, I could say, as your parent, I don't want you to feel alone with all that. Mm. You know, because feeling alone with it, being at 2.30 in the morning, it's an awful way to feel. And I love you. And I just don't want you to feel alone with it. That's why we're talking. So can you see how that wow. might be helpful? Even, even I felt relief. <laughs> just listening to you, I felt relieved. And, and I'm not the kid, right? Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, because uh, it's something that I read you said. It's, and I, I've seen it on in one of Dr. Edwin Schneidman's book. I, books I don't know which one and I know you you worked with him he was your mentor right or something mm -hmm. yeah and I actually interviewed him years ago right before he died I was so sad to know he died but uh, it, uh, the the thing with suicide and this this unbearable pain half of it is the pain and the other half is being alone with it right yeah in fact I, I wrote an article uh, after Anthony Bourdain killed himself mm. and it was called, and you can find it, Why People Kill Themselves, It's Not Depression. Yeah. And I'm got, so glad you touched on this. Can I just interrupt and ask you to, uh, to just, just give my listeners some, uh, your view on this? Because today, everything is a mental disease, right? You're sad, it's depression. You're agitated, it's anxiety. And I'm not saying that it isn't. Sometimes it is clinical. It can be. But let's just back up a little bit and, and look at emotions as things that you're supposed to do. You're, you're human, it's normal, and not medicate everything. So can I hear your view on that? Sure. So the article, Why People Kill Themselves, is not depression. Uh, I think it's up on Medium. It had 500,000 views in a week. Mm. And, and what I said is there's hundreds of millions of people <clears throat> who have depression and they don't kill themselves. There's people who lose jobs and don't kill themselves. People who, whose marriages go away, they don't kill themselves. They can all contribute to it. It could be a last straw, but you know, I, I was a suicide specialist for 30 years. None of my patients died by suicide. And I think what I observed is at the end, one of the things they all had in common was despair. And if you break the word despair, into DES-PAIR, it means unpaired. So mm -hmm. unpaired with reasons to live, hope less, help less, power less, worth less, use less, meaningless, purposeless. And when they all add up pointless, and so what happens is people pair with death to take the pain away. Wow. Yeah. And one of the things that I learned to do, and I have a new book coming out called Why Cope When You Can Heal. And, and I've been trying to figure out for 30 years what it is, what it is that I did that they didn't end up killing themselves. And uh, we have a term for it and we're announcing it in Why Cope When You Can Heal. And the term is surgical empathy surgical empathy and what surgical empathy is is that when you can go into the hopelessness 
in a way in which they feel felt by you, not just understood, not just the problem to be solved. When they feel felt by you, they start to cry with relief. So I'll share an anecdote, which, uh, which changed everything for me. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Schneidman was one of my early mentors and he referred me probably the majority of my suicidal patients. Uh, mm -hmm. He would go in, do a consultation at UCLA uh, and some of these patients needed to be discharged and the residents didn't necessarily want to see them because they were still suicidal. They weren't acutely suicidal, but it was part of them, yeah. but you can't keep them there forever. So he would go up, do a consultation, call me and then refer them to me so they could be discharged. And there was one woman named Nancy. And I'd been seeing Nancy for about, oh, seven months or so. And I didn't think I was helping her at all. I mean, she came in two, three times a week. She rarely talked. And that was as long as she'd gone without a suicide attempt or hospitalization, but I didn't think I was helping her at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then there was one day when uh, I had moonlighted at a psychiatric hospital. Moonlighting means, you know, you, you cover for other doctors and I covered for them on a weekend at Metropolitan State Hospital in Norwalk, California. And sometimes you don't sleep for 30 hours, you know, when you're covering for people. And so on a Monday morning, there's Nancy and Nancy never really made eye contact. So I'm looking at you and you're looking at me, but she'd be like this. She wasn't catatonic, sideways, but, yeah. but she would be you know, sideways. And so as I'm seated in the room with Nancy, suddenly all the color that I'm looking at turned to black and white. So I'm looking at a room and it's now black and white. And then I started to feel chills and cold, and I thought I'm having a stroke or a seizure. Now I'm a medical <gasps> doctor. Wow. So I thought I'm having a stroke or seizure, and I do a neurologic exam of myself. So she's still not looking at me, and it wasn't rude. So I'm tapping my, you know, I'm looking at my fingers, I'm tapping my elbows, tapping my knees to see if I'm having a stroke or a seizure. Wow. And, uh, and then she didn't look at me and I realized I'm not having a stroke or a seizure. And then I had this crazy idea that I was looking out at the world and feeling the way she felt. Wow, black and white. Yeah. Black and white, cold and chilly. And because I was sleep deprived, this is what I said to her. I said, Nancy, I didn't know it was so bad and I can't help you kill yourself. But if you do, I will still think well of you. I will miss you. And maybe I'll understand why you had to do it to get out of the pain. Mm. And I thought to myself, I just blew it. I just gave her permission. What wow. the heck did I say? Scary. Yeah. And then she looked at me for the first time and she looked right into my eyes, like I'm looking into yours. And she said, if you can really understand why I might have to kill myself to get out of the pain maybe i won't need to and then she smiled wow that was all you needed to know for your career huh oh yeah, wow. yeah. that was it. and then i said to her because i had her eye contact like i have yours and i said i'll tell you what i'm gonna do i'm not gonna give you treatments or solutions that you've already tried and then and then you, you'll come back and then you have to tell me why you didn't try it. Would it be okay if I didn't give you any, you know, treatments, solutions or whatever, you know, unless we came up with them together, would that be okay? And she looked at me with a look that said, keep talking, I'm intrigued. And I said, this is what I'm going to do. So, so imagine feeling this. I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find you wherever you are. And I'm going to keep you company there as long as it takes because you've been there alone too long. Would that be okay? And she started to tear up. So surgical empathy is going into, and I, we call it surgical empathy, because if you think of hopelessness, which is what many suicidal people feel, without hope, unpaired with mm -hmm. hope, mm -hmm. I, I, we look at hopelessness like an abscess in the dark night of the soul. 
it's an abscess they're stuck there mm -hmm. and so surgical empathy is going into it in a way in which they feel not just understood they feel felt and when they feel felt the pus starts to drain as tears of relief yeah dr goldson you showed me something i want to jump into the beginning of the interview now actually before the interview you were showing me something we might not have time to cover the whole thing but well, maybe the second part well, the let's, exercise let's, well, what let's, do you think i think i can do it in five minutes but people can go back to this so let's share the okay. screen okay we're going to just so my listeners know of the podcast i'm going to have a link to where this material is he's going to share with us it's very easy flowing very straightforward to parents but if you want to see it you can either watch on my youtube channel the video of this interview or you can just follow on my notes i'm going to have the link okay Great. but okay, he's so going we'll to explain that. it and yeah. i'll explain it so here we go so do i do i get to share yeah there we go okay so uh if you go to markgoulston.com, M-A-R-K-G-O-U-L-S-T-O-N.com, I have lots of blogs and you'll see one. Uh, and there's an article called How You Became You. And in it, there are three graphics. And the one I'm looking at, the first one is called How Personality Develops. And what it really describes is as we're getting, as we go from birth to infancy to childhood to adult, we're always stepping into the unknown. When we step into the unknown, especially as a child, we look back to our parents. So if we fall down, we don't know if it's, if it's really a bad thing. We look back at our parents to somehow reassure us that we can make it through it. Or if we hit a home run, we think it's good, but we don't know how great it is. We look at our parents for them to say that was really good. And we keep doing this. And depending on how they respond to us, we internalize their reaction. And that's how we move into life. So if you look back at parents and, uh, 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 and, the, and they respond in a certain way, you internalize them. So there's the first graphic I just described is how personality develops. And there's some narrative as you go down. And then the next graphic is what your life becomes. And so if you can imagine that you fall down and there's four responses your parents can have. Let's say, let's say you, get, you, you have a problem. They can coddle you, they can be negative, they can be absent, or they can be the fourth category, which we call a loving mentor coach. And let me give you an example of what this looks like. Let's say you're a five or six-year-old, you have a five or six-year-old uh, daughter or son. Uh, we'll make it a daughter. And let's say she's at school and she had an accident and she peed through her clothes and there was a puddle underneath her and the bully in the class came over and started laughing and ridiculing her and brought everybody over and they all ridiculed and laughed at her and she ran into the girl's room because she couldn't, she ran away and she comes home and you don't know what's happened uh, and, uh, and the coddling response would be, uh, what happened? Oh, what happened? And she tells you, and you immediately jump in, oh, that's so awful. Oh, you know, uh, 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 let me buy you something. Let's go out and get some ice cream. Oh, I'm so sorry. And, and, uh, and we're going to go talk to the principal. We're going to talk to those parents. We're going to take care of all this. And so that's very nice and protective. But the point is, you're doing it all for her. So she's not learning how to cope with it. She's just learning that mom or dad will take care of it. And when she grows up, she's going to be used to you doing everything for her, including writing her college essay. And then when she gets older and she runs into a problem, she's going to develop compulsions. What's a compulsion? When she eats too much, she drinks too much, she, whatever, she feels better. Or if it's a boy, when they go on their video games, it's a compulsion. It's a way of coddling them out of a bad mood. Or imagine a parent who's critical and says, we told you to go to the bathroom before you go to school. Now just sit in that and then come to dinner and then you learn your lesson so that you don't do this again. And so what she's going to feel is hurt and angry. She's going to go up to her room and she's going to develop this really negative attitude as a teenager 
She's going to become a blamer because she learned blaming from you. And someone who's only a blamer and grows old, they become bitter. The third response is, is you just, she's absent. Your parents are absent. Uh, your parent would say, oh, geez, that, yeah, I'm sorry about that. Just, you know, just get ready. You know, your dad's out of work. Just, you know, come, we'll have dinner and, you know, it, it'll be okay. But what you feel is afraid. You know, this awful thing happened and you feel afraid. And so you go through life tentative. You don't take chances because if you take chances and you fall on your face, no one's going to help you. And at the end of your life, it's kind of empty because you didn't take chances. Now, the final row is the parent who is a loving teacher, mentor, coach. And what does that look like? So you're that parent, your daughter comes in and you say, what happened? Nothing. I'm fine. No, you're not fine. What happened? Well, I, I, I peed in my clothes. Oh, no. What happened then? Well, you know, Johnny, uh, you know, he's a class bully. He laughed at me. He brought everyone over. They all yelled, laughed at me. And, and what happened next? Well, I went into the girls' room and they couldn't find me. And you're going to have to go in and talk to the principal because I got a note. And so that parent hears you all the way through. But this is what they say to you. Uh, I want, we're going to practice something and you're going to try it tomorrow with Johnny. What you're going to do with Johnny tomorrow is you're going to go back to school. You're going to go up to Johnny. You're going to make sure that there's all these kids around him and you're going to get up to Johnny and you're a foot and a half away and you say, Johnny, and you look him right in the eye and you say, remember yesterday when I peed my clothes and he's going to smile uncomfortably and you say, yeah. And you look them straight in the eye and you say, I felt like such a baby. Has that ever happened to you? And then you're going to stare at Johnny and he's not going to know what to do. And everybody around him is going to say, oh my God, you stood up to Johnny. So let's practice it. Try it out tomorrow. Let me know how it works out. So can you see the difference in all those different parenting styles? I mean, how the final one really just helps you make it through anything. And in that article, so you can see this as a graphic, in the article, there's a third graphic called the seven habits of well-adjusted children. And it's actually something that you as a family can do. And, and, and quite briefly, what it is, is you, you write down seven things and you tear them into seven pieces of paper. And every day, one person in the family picks one of these and everybody in the family does whatever it says. And then you report back, back at the end of the day. And then at the end of seven days, you report back what was the best habit. And then you just juggle them and keep doing it until everybody, including mom and dad, internalize these. And so here are the habits. The first one is uh, feeling frustrated or disappointed without getting overly angry. Second one is keeping trying something hard instead of quitting. Third thing is staying focused on something important. Fourth is cheerfully doing something you don't want to do. Fifth is focusing uh, on the positive of a situation instead of the negative. Sixth is smiling about something. Seventh is doing, uh, doing something for thanking, congratulating, or apologizing for something uh, to someone that will help someone else. So you, you juggle and you choose one, you present it to the family, or it can be any family member, right? In the morning, and then at night you go back to it and say, okay, so what happened to each of them? That's these? exactly right. At the end of seven days, you say, what was the best thing? And you just keep juggling them week after week, and you all eventually internalize these habits. And so what happens is the family will become a loving teacher, mentor, coach to each other. Mm. But, but we have to, uh, we're okay. running short. Okay. Okay. We're back. I stopped the screen sharing. Now okay. we're back because I know you have to go and I know you have uh, another call. Thank you so much for your help and for your information. I'm going to have all of these, all these links, the links to your books, everything in my notes. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. And, and, uh, and to your audience, um, you know, we're all going through COVID and 
And something one of my patients said to me, which has always stuck with me, uh, and she overcame a big trauma. And she said, what it comes down to is living with life never being the same again. Doesn't mean our lives are over. After 9-11, we, uh, we all lived with life being different. Doesn't mean our life's over. And we're all going to get through this. And it will be different. And it may yeah. be better. Mm -hmm. So all of you take care of yourselves. Yes, thank you. And be safe. Thank you, Dr. Gustin. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye.